So, um, what I have to teach on is really just going a little deeper in what I taught on two or three weeks ago on authority in the kingdom of God. And this is the handout that I um, prepared for that night. And, and I, well, you guys are busy. <laughs> um, and, and it actually, it was recorded, it's on YouTube, uh, the, just following that outline. But in praying about it over the last couple of weeks, I felt like the Lord was saying, we didn't quite get it. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was such a, not so much controversial, but upside down from the way we're usually looking at authority that one teaching, yeah, I've got it, is probably not going to do it. Because it's such a paradigm shift in the way the body of Christ looks at authority. And most of the time, um, we think of authority in kind of a, in a top-down structure, which is just the opposite of the way God thinks of authority. Because it's an upside-down kingdom from the bottom up. So I'm just going to cover just a couple of the points. I'm not going to go over the full handout, but just a couple of the points that I think are really key. And then I want to show a video, which is a good example of this lady who really understands her identity in Christ and her authority. And it will kind of be a jumping point for us to discuss how this applies to my own life personally. And the Lord has given me a couple of really neat um, confirmations in the last couple of weeks from two different books that this lady right here uh, actually wrote. Uh, so, the definition of authority according to Jesus. Let, let's turn and look at that scripture. It's John 17, verse 2. I will read it. Um, he says, uh, Father, the times come, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And in that definition of authority, Jesus is saying, you have given me authority. And because you've given me authority, I can give life to others. So, and as we know, that meant he went to the cross. So, because he had authority, he was able to lay down his life for those he had authority over. And by laying down his life for others, he was able to lift them up into eternal life so that they may know the Father and know Jesus Christ, that they may experience life. So we can see from here that to have authority calls for dying of self so that others may, lead, may live. And those that walk in the authority of heaven tend to lay down their lives and sacrifice themselves and, and, and their own desires for the calling of God on the people they lead which is just the opposite from the kind of authority that man has, that man's kind of authority, which is generally uh, a person who has a vision, a purpose, uh, a plan, and wants others to come help. <laughs> come, come help me build what it is I'm building. And, and so he invites people to come, or she invites people to come help him, versus the kind of authority that Jesus talks about is just the opposite, which is the heart of a servant. If you want to be the greatest of all, you'll be the servant of all. Um, I did not come to lord it over others. I came to serve. I came to wash feet. Uh, so we can recognize authority in the second bullet. In Matthew 8, I'm going to turn to that real briefly. I'm going to make this really quick because I don't want to dig into a lot of details here. I just want to get the main points. Um, Jesus was approached by, in Capernaum by a centurion. Now, Jesus lived in Capernaum for several years, was living there now, and that's not that big a community. So he knew this man. This man knew him. Um, Peter was also from Capernaum. 
The centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed in terrible suffering. Jesus said, I'll go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. For just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself and a man under authority with soldiers unto me, I tell this one to do it. And he does it. And Jesus replied, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. So the man said, he didn't say, because I have authority, I can tell people what to do. He said, because I'm under authority, I have power in the situations. And so we gain from that, that you recognize authority because you're under authority and have power. So we can kind of build a diagram here of being under authority produces power. Not having authority, but to be under authority produces power. And then that power we need to look at is what Jesus has all authority. And when he gained all authority, he gained all authority over every principality, power, sickness, disease, death, um, the flesh, the law, the sin. He has authority over everything, and that's the power that we can have when we're under his authority. And just as Jesus laid down his life so that we can be under his authority and under his authority have power, then as we are in places of authority, we're called to do the same so that others can have power. All right, so I want to show you this little video here. This is Anna Mendez, and as you watch it, look for the shooting light, which was not man-made. Can anybody see? That's good. Yeah, that's good. So what I wanted you to see in that, first of all, just the awesome power of Jesus setting the captive free, Sanidad, that ruling spirit, in Spanish means holiness, so it was a false holiness that was holding her down. And is that, I don't know if you know, if you heard at the very beginning where she said, now I'm going to manifest myself as light. Did you catch that? No, it, it was, she said it, but there was a lot of, yeah. She, she said uh, it was just before the lights started flashing. She said, before the enemy, I'm going to manifest myself as light. And that's when she took a step toward the lady. And when she did, you could kind of just see her like, here I come. And that's when the light started flashing around all over the room. So she was so certain of her identity and the power that she carried but when she came right down to setting her free, it was all about this woman has her free will and the devil cannot take our free will. That's the one thing that God does not allow him to touch is our choice. We always have a choice. Well, it's not the only thing he doesn't allow to be touched, but definitely does not allow our free will. We always have a choice. And, and then the other thing that was so significant to this is when she went in to say, now I'm, we're, I'm going to take you by the hand. It wasn't, I'm going to take you out. Jesus is coming in and Jesus is bringing you out. So she was inviting Jesus to minister the actual deliverance, which he did. And, and when she took her hand, that lady was taking the hand of Jesus. And Jesus was the one that took her out. And she was free. So she was secure in her identity as a daughter of light, that she was light, that she is light. And she was also totally dependent on Jesus to set the captive free. It wasn't her responsibility, her work. She just showed up hidden in Christ. And it's a really good example of someone who knows their authority. I, you know, I don't want to get into her story too much, but she was a satanic witch for many years before she uh, gave herself to Jesus. And Jesus, she was on her deathbed 
when uh, almost dead when uh, a man came to her and told her about Jesus and she was immediately um, healed. She was in a psychiatric hospital because she was also going crazy. And she said the two weeks she stayed in the hospital, the hospital was almost empty before she left because she just went around healing the sick and casting out demons all over the hospital. Um, so she just immediately entered into the authority of a daughter of God, a son of God, out of, but, but the thing that has, I've learned from her is she was so familiar with the kingdom of darkness because she had worked her way up in the hierarchy of darkness where she was actually communicating directly with Satan in a lot of the work she was doing. So she was very familiar. But she said in one of her tapes, there were some people that um, he could, even Satan himself couldn't touch. And he said those, those were the ones who love unconditionally. So, so I, I want us to think in the terms of authority Authority over men, like pastors and uh, ministry leaders or whatever, are those who are willing to lay down their lives to serve others, to give up their agenda to empower and enable others. I want us to talk about that, but then also to talk about our authority over all the kingdom of darkness and, and all the works of the devil that Jesus overcame at the cross has given authority to us is Colossians 2. Well, one thing I want to say, I'm going to put this up here, because, and, and this is where, I, I think sometimes, it's okay, you can just set it here on the floor and I'll work all right on the top. Right. I just want to put this word up here because it's so misunderstood. Covering. Um, and just say, being under authority is not being under covering. It, it's not in the scripture. You can't find it anywhere. It's just being under the authority of man is not being under covering. Um, the only connection to the word covering in the scripture is a woman's hair is given her for a covering. That, that's about the only way you can make that, that leap over, well, I submit to my pastor, I'm under his covering. But, but the truth is, we are covered in Jesus. We are hidden in Christ. Jesus is our covering because we're hidden in Him. And we don't need any more covering for protection. Our protection is because we are hidden in Christ, because we are light, because we are light in a dark place. And, but we do submit. And in Ephesians, and we talked about the whole book of Ephesians is just this blueprint of spiritual victory, uh, first sitting with God, walking with man, and standing against the enemy, the three categories, sit, walk, stand, sit with God, walk with man, and stand against the enemy. And before you can stand against the enemy, you need to be seated with God, you need to know who you are, and you need to walk uprightly with men, so that you're in your right relationship with men. And then part of that walking rightly with men is Ephesians 5, which talk, 4 and 5, which talks about submit one to another. So, and, and, and let's read that because it's, uh, it's Ephesians 5, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that word submit, if you look in the Greek, it means to listen to and see to the needs of another. Listen to and see to the needs of another. Now, if, it, if we take it the way sometimes it's taken to mean obey, do what they tell you to do. You have to do what your pastor tells you to do, or whatever, because you're submitted to your pastor. But this scripture says, submit one to another. That means that the pastor submits to uh, his people, his people submit to him. There's an equal flowing of submission in the room. And everyone is told to submit to everyone else. And that means every one of us, whoever's leader or follower, it doesn't matter, we're all listening to and seeing to the needs of the other. And then specifically he talks about wives submit to your husbands, but that word submit is the same word as the verse in 21. Listen to and see to your needs, to see to the needs of your husband. 
as well as the wife. The husband is told to submit to the wife, listen to and see to the needs of your wife. There's a, there's still, a, a, we're all submitting to one another. So I just want to say what authority is not. Authority is not a covering. Uh, our covering is Jesus Christ. And Peter said when he was called before the Sanhedrin, I must obey God. So we submit to men, but we obey God. So I'm really just kind of talking about what authority is not, how it's sometimes misunderstood, because we must learn what true authority is. Sometimes we have to unlearn what we've been taught past. I want to read two passages from these books. Um, the power of leadership, the power of a leader sent from heaven will loose over each one of us the activation of our purpose on earth. When a believer finds himself under true leadership from heaven authority, he will immediately see how he begins to move toward his calling. He will begin to see himself in a different way. He will begin to see with clarity the qualities that God has given him. He will begin to believe in himself as a son of God and his development will be released. And then another one. Um, wait, lost my page number. I'm one eight. Okay. In the foundation of the government of Christ, there are apostles and prophets who are not seeking to be seen, but instead they are covered. They are covered by precious stones. These being their spiritual disciples, raised up by pastors, teachers, and evangelists to shine forth as the fruit of their true apostleship in the context of the fivefold ministry. So we're talking about the true leadership empowers those who are being led by heaven's authority. And we talked about that last uh, Saturday morning when we were all kind of gathered and just talking about um, when I read that, that uh, paragraph in this book, the first time I was at home reading it and I read that paragraph and I thought, wow, this lady really gets it. This is really awesome. And, and the Lord was, was asking me, ask everyone how much personal authority, personal influence you have seen increased in your life since we have been meeting for the past year. And, and it was kind of an eye-opening when I started thinking about how different people in the, in the Red Table group have just grown in their own authority and their own identity and in their own ministry. And, and I heard the Lord say, yes, it's working. It, it was like we kind of got confused about where we were doing, what we were about because we, we were expecting to grow something from the ground up. We were expecting to build something. I, I know, well, you know, it's hard to say what we were expecting because we didn't quite know what to expect. But if you compare it to what normal ministries look like, ministries that we're all accustomed to seeing, they come together because the leader has a common vision and they all build something according to the vision of the leader. And, and so something goes up like a Tower of Babel, if you will. <laughs> we come together and make a name for ourselves and we build something. But God's leadership is just the opposite. The leaders are like the silent, the silent people in the background who are praying and discipling and helping and supporting and serving and washing feet while the people following are out doing stuff and are stepping into their own destiny, their own calling, their own vision, their own empowerment, and finding out who they are. And, and this morning when I was praying about tonight, the Lord gave me another example. I'm just seeing it everywhere now. It's, it's like I found the code, and now that I found the code, it's everywhere. And, 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 I, and I want to, because I've been really confused last year. What is Red Table all about? And I've asked the Lord over and over again, what are we doing? And I didn't feel like I got the clarity of it until just the last, since Resurrection Weekend, he kind of started unfolding it. No, actually, it's a little later. Choosing number seven, Acts 6. The 12 apostles were leading the charge from Acts 2 to Acts 5. 
They were performing the miracles. They were out getting beat up. They would get called before the court. They were out doing the stuff. And everybody was, yay, the 12 are going doing the stuff. And they were followed. And then in chapter 6, the uh, apostles, the 12, get this aha moment. Oh, wait, we're not supposed to be leading the charge. We're not supposed to be out here doing the stuff. Our job is prayer and ministry of the word. And so, and, and it was interesting here, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables, in other, in other, in other words, in order to serve the people. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn the responsibility over them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. He, those 12 didn't go a point, seven. They said, brothers, you go choose seven. Now, there's no control there. Mm -hmm. There is no hierarchy there. There's no top-down, I choose my group. Mm -hmm. uh, but they brought the seven to the twelve. The twelve laid their hands on them, and then we know what happened next. Stephen and Philip were two of those twelve. They were the ones now. Up to that point, it was the twelve doing the miracles, the supernatural signs and wonders. And then after that, it was the seven that the people had chosen were out doing it. Now, I've heard Bill Johnson talk, teach, and I'm sure there's different truths in, in what happened here with the apostles. That because the apostles kind of got a little, you know, like they weren't willing to get their hands dirty and so uh, to wait tables, and so God moved on to those who were. And there might be some truth to that. I'm not trying to judge that at all. But I'm just saying it could be that these 12 got the bigger picture of what leadership from heaven was all about. And they understood that they couldn't continue to lead the charge. That they had to get back in the background and, and number one, spend their time in prayer. And number two, the ministry of the word. And others would go forth that they were leading and supporting and cheering on to do the work of the ministry. And, and this, I believe, is exactly what this lady is referring to in the books, that true leadership from heaven will stay in, in the secret, less visible place while those they're discipling are out leading revivals, left and right. And that's the way it's supposed to be. That, that's the leadership as it is in heaven. So let's pause before we go on to authority over the enemy because I do want to land there. But can somebody add to that? Kind of just let's process this a little bit. How does that sit with you first? Wonderful. It makes sense. <laughs> it make it 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 makes sense. It makes sense. I think, like you said, the twelve got the picture, but I think the next generation misused it. Yeah, yes. Okay, they did what they were doing by being back, but they're no longer with the people. I mean, it's what you have in a lot of your higher churches, you know, like Catholicism and, and that. They missed it. So it wasn't passed on. You know, we lost it 300 years later, for sure, with um, Constantine. Yeah, mm -hmm. Constantine. Mm -hmm. But it was really already there in the, from Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, was where it started when God had given the command from the Garden of Eden all the way up to Genesis 11, scatter, scatter, scatter. Go out, go out, go out, go out. And then in Genesis 11, that group of people settled and said, let's stay here, build a name for ourselves so we will not be scattered. They gathered. And that flip from scatter to gather is what got them in a lot of trouble. And I was writing down, um, make a name, build a structure, build a ministry, if you will, build a whatever you want to build, build a church or whatever. Uh, use bricks and not stone. They're uniform. We all must act alike, be alike, obey everybody. <laughs> you know, be uniform. And don't scatter, but gather. That's like my sheep, my flock, 
I rule over, I, sh I shepherd my flock mentality. Um, and resist the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven is just the opposite of that. And I'm not, I'm not being negative toward religious structures, but I guess in a way I am, that in the restoration of all things, this Babylonian structure of top-down, let's all build something that we can make a name for ourselves, it's not that a church 100% of the time is always doing that, and I'm not saying that because that would be judging, and it's not true for every church. But in many cases it is that it's about let's build, let's build up, let's make a name for ourselves, let's gather, let's don't scatter. So it did get into the early church, uh, but in 300 AD it went big time in it because that's when the decision was made to form the, the clergy and the laity, that one move just really the vision. Yeah, just flipped what Jesus had set in place, turned it upside down. And then when Martin Luther came on and others in the Reformation in the 1500s, he got salvation by grace, but he didn't abandon the structure. He, he kept the structure going. They still had the laity and the clergy and the the structure, and we're still working our way out of that. And and we will. We're, we're working our way out of it right now with the oil ministry. Um, you can see how God is using that oil. It's not so much in the churches, and it's not so much with professional ministries or ministers. It's more, as Leslie said this morning, it's activating people who have not yet been activated, who've been the pew sitters. They're getting activated. It's like God is using that oil to scatter. To scatter. You can see and feel the anointing to scatter in that oil. And, and it is this new paradigm of leadership as it is in heaven coming forth. It's not full grown yet, so you can't truly you know, identify it fully, but you can begin to identify it. You can begin to see, like, like you said this morning, activation is one thing that's coming out of the oil. And actually, yesterday morning I was praying and asking the Lord about what is the purpose of the oil, and I heard the word activation, and you used it this morning. It, it, it's, taking, it's taking people out of the following mode into we're all following Jesus. Even that, uh, the first Christian church down to Get Road, have you seen the sign on their marquee lately? It says, uh, we are not followers of, Jesus did not say follow man, he said follow me. It's just, it's everywhere guys. It is just coming out everywhere. Okay, anybody add something else to that? I'm talking too much and that's not what I want to do right now. What do you think? To me, it boils down to inner healing. Um, everything goes back to, to that for me. Like, you know, you're talking about how people got to where they wanted to be seen, and it was about following people rather than Jesus. And I think it's because God in us gave, gave us an innate need to be seen as children. You know, what do you do with your children? You look at them, you play with them, you, you're always smiling at them. Yeah, he gave us that innate need, mm -hmm. and there's so much unmet need in the world today mm -hmm. um, that I think that's part of that, um, why people are so wanting to be seen, because of that unmet need that God, that God intended but did not get met. Oh, hallelujah. I'm so glad you mentioned that, because where we're going to land tonight is the next step will be to heal our identity where shame has any kind of place in us. And it's shame in the orphan heart that causes us to need a name, to want a name, to have a following, to be seen. That's the orphan heart and that's shame. And, and the next topic to talk about is going to be shame. And while I'm on that, I meant to say at the beginning, there's a box of books over there. We just got the book in print. And there's a chapter on shame. 
Everybody here gets you a free book out of the box before you leave, if you haven't got one already. And the next time we meet, we're going to talk about shame. And if you could read that one little short chapter on shame before we meet, we'll all have a jump start for that night. Because you can't walk in this kind of authority if you have shame or an orphan heart. Because you can't give it up. You can't give up being a head honcho. It's, it's too important to you. It's too precious. Because you need it for your identity that is broken. Good point. Very good. Somebody else. All right, let's look at Colossians 2. Colossians 2, we started out there um, when we were talking about identity, but it lists the six, um, five, I'm sorry, five things that Jesus overcame at the cross. They're not the only five, but they're five important ones. And it is, uh, let me read Colossians 2, let's start with verse 9. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head of every power and authority. I want to stop there and say, Christ is the fullness of God, and we have been given the fullness of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's that there's everything. Mm -hmm. It is finished. We start out at the finish line with everything given to us, and nothing is held back. We have all that Jesus attained is ours. Mm -hmm. We have everything. Who is the head over every power and authority, so there's over evil. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. There is the sinful nature, sometimes called the flesh. Not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. There is victory over death. So we've got evil, the flesh, and death. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, so there are sins. Having canceled the written code, there is the law. With its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the power and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So I'm going to summarize it all by saying... When we are under authority, that yields power, as we read in Matthew 8, over, and I'm going to list five here, evil, sin, flesh, death, and that includes sickness and disease, and the law. Okay, so there is our authority in Christ. We have authority over sin, authority over flesh, and there's, there's a difference, authority over the law, authority over evil, authority even over death. And as this lady can manifest herself as light, that's where we all in this room are headed. That we so know our healed identity that we can manifest as light. And when we manifest as light, I've actually seen people as light. The Lord's let me see lots of people from time to time. I can look at them and God will show me the light in them. It's full of sparkly diamonds, starburst. It's not just light. It's spectacular light. <laughs> and, and as we see and look at each other, and we learn to relate to each other light to light, Jesus to Jesus, authority to authority, all these issues of not being able to walk with men in Ephesians will fall at our feet. And we will step into Ephesians 6, where we can stand against any wiles of the enemy. And everything will be exposed in that light that we are. And, and that's where we are headed as 
sons of God revealed in this community and creation, that means all the lost, are groaning for us to be revealed as the sons of God. And as we learn our true identity as sons of God, nothing's going to stop us. And it's just a matter of receiving that revelation that we have, because we're under authority, we have power, authority over all of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <That's gonna work. laughs> ah. <laughs> yes! <laughs> so now let's, let's, let's break it down a little bit. Which one of these you want to talk about? Which one seems most impossible? Let's take sin. I would like to take sin. How is it we have authority over sin? If you're struggling with a sin, how is it that you can see yourself having authority over that sin? I, I, would, I remember talking with a lady who was so struggling with forgiving her daughter who had totally, seriously wronged her. And uh, she just didn't think she could forgive her. And she got the revelation that she had authority over sin, and she jumped, she literally jumped up out of her chair. She said, I have authority to forgive my daughter. I forgive her right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she just danced a jig, literally. <laughs> and the next day, that was in, uh, we were doing a conference, and the next day she came back. Her daughter uh, was actually there that night in her home, and she said, my daughter was so shocked at my forgiving her and truly from my heart mm -hmm. holding nothing back from her that she said, Mom, I don't know what's happened to you, but you're different and I can be different too. It, there was a reconciliation that happened there simply because this woman got the revelation that she had authority over sin, that she didn't have to allow sin to rule over her. Now, here's, here's one way that you can know you have authority over sin. And it's the scripture where Jesus says, or I forget I think who said it, Paul maybe, that there is no temptation that he doesn't provide a way to escape. And there's no temptation he puts in front of you that you cannot overcome. Now, right there, that says you have authority over any sin. Because Jesus is not going to allow you, he's protecting you, that you will not be tempted with a sin that you will not have a way to take authority over. You always have free will. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, forgiveness. Uh, with having the authority and the power to forgive and uh, when you don't and you have the free will when you don't feel like forgiving but you choose to forgive isn't that what you're saying you choose to forgive and when you choose to forgive then the forgiveness comes into your heart instead of waiting on the forgiveness to come into your heart and then to yes that's right. You always have free will, and your choice is your free will. So, but it goes against what you feel, that you know that's wrong, but what you know to do that you know is right. That's right. So you choose to forgive, and in choosing to forgive, then forgiveness floods your heart. Takes you there. Right. Mm -hmm. Takes you there. One With Jesus' help. One we, thing I've noticed in that is there's an action. I know in my own life, he's required an action on my part after I have chosen to forgive. Yes. Because it's not the action, with just a decision. With the action of obedience, not because you care about them, because you want to be obedient to him because you know how much he loves you and you don't want, you know, that relationship. Once you do what he's asked you to do, and it'll probably be something you don't want to do in the flesh, but when you do it, it does change. That's what, in my life, I, I have seen. Yeah, I have actually heard it taught that forgiveness is just a decision, but it's not. No, it's an action. It's a, it's a change of heart. Mm -hmm. 
because in it's Matthew It's the same with asking forgiveness too, isn't it? How? Well, uh, if, if, uh, if you know you've wronged someone, but maybe you've justified it, but you know that the right thing to do, whether they wronged you and you wronged them, that you know the right thing to do is go to them, be, I would heard it said the better person, that doesn't necessarily mean the better person, but the right thing to do is to go and ask forgiveness. And in asking forgiveness, you're choosing that, that will. I'm going to ask, for, even though I don't feel like I should ask for forgiveness, but I know if I ask for forgiveness, our relationship's going to be healed. So I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it for the greater good. So I go and ask for forgiveness. and Because I've done this. And I've asked for forgiveness. And once I've asked for forgiveness, I've seen the breakthrough in that. Mm -hmm. I've seen them break, break down and then our relationship was healed <clears throat> but it took me to go ask for forgiveness than it did yeah I agree because I, right. I know like me if if I know I hope I would I believe I would if I'm if, if I find out that I've hurt someone or that someone has hurt me whatever I would go forgive them I would let them know I forgive them uh but at the same time, if I believe that I've wronged someone or hurt someone, even though I felt like it was vengeance or something that was justified, I would hope that I would choose to go ask for forgiveness to heal the relationship, even though I didn't feel like it. Right. It's still that free will, it's still that authority, it's still that power. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's obedience, even though you don't. It's a clear conscience. Yes. Yes. That's taking the kingdom of God by force. That's yes, exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reach into heaven and pull heaven into earth. Mm -hmm. It's what we're doing. That's true. It's taking the kingdom of heaven by force. Yeah, it really does so open the doors of love. It does. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it breaks through all of the walls that have been built by unforgiveness. Yeah. Quickly. They, they really and it's making yourself happen. vulnerable. You know, we talk about forgiveness, judgment, and offense. Forgiveness, you owe me. Judgment, I accuse you. And then uh, offense, I protect myself. Say that again. Um, forgiveness, you owe me. Forgive me. Um, judgment, I charge you, I accuse you. And offense is... I withdraw my heart. I protect myself. You go on the defense when there's an offense. Defend yourself. And when you go and ask someone forgiveness, even though you think they're, they sin better more against me than I sin against mm -hmm. them, they should come to me because they're the really the ones that are at fault. And I'm just a little bit at fault. You know, um, that will hold you in bondage. Mm -hmm. Somebody once gave me a good uh, rule of thumb about that. Because very seldom is it just one person's fault. There's always something in you. And basically he said, if uh, you may be 90% right and 10% wrong, God still holds you responsible to ask forgiveness for the 10% that's... And if you look at it that way, there's always something you can ask forgiveness for. You don't have to make it up. You don't right. have to say, well, I really know that there's nothing wrong. Let me just do it. No, there's, there's something. Yeah. So, helps. you're right. Good. So it's being under authority here that gives you the authority over this. And under authority is under the authority of Jesus Christ, which means you're seated with Him, you're on His side, you're seeing it, you're greeting with Him. And that's the humility that He walked in. The revelation has to be there. You know, you can know this intellectually yeah. and go out and fall flat on your face. It's got to be a revelation. It's got to be a revelation. That's right. Mm -hmm. You can't just take the scripture and say, oh, I agree with that. We're all good. Right. It's got to be here. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a place you come to when you see this, the authority we have over all of this is binary. It's a yes or a no. It's true or it's not true. God's word is either true or it's not true. 
And it's not wishy-washy, true one day and not true the next. True in this situation, but not true there. And at some point, faith rises up to say, this is either true or it's not true. If I say yes to it, it will do its work in me. If I don't say yes to it, it will not do its work in me. But it's the yes that God is waiting for. And once you say the yes with all conviction of your heart, soul, mind, and spirit, that's when you pull the kingdom from heaven into earth. You just, I've got it. I'm taking it. This is mine. And it is an act, an action, like Ruby said. It's not just a decision. It's got to be a action of force to say I'm either <clears throat> this is either over me or I'm over it. it can't both be true so it is if someone has wronged me or I've wronged someone either way in, in this sense if I don't go ask their forgiveness or forgive them that sin has power over me mm-hmm but if I do go do that, I take right. the power over it. That's right. That's the idea. That's absolutely right. And it doesn't matter whose sin it is. No. Mm-hmm. Like you're just taking authority over sin. Yes. That the actual whatever's going on, whatever the circumstance is, no matter who it belongs to or started it, you're just saying this is neutral and it doesn't belong to me and it doesn't belong to you by my declaration because it belongs to God. I'm putting it under the authority of God. Yeah. You're yeah. diffusing ownership, is yeah. that right? Yeah. You take ownership of your life, you can walk in the victory of Christ regardless of what the other person does. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this God, is between God. you and God. It's really between you and so God. So fixing your part of it is gonna fix, is gonna disconnect you from the whole of it? Disconnect you from dis- the sin in it. Yes. it will have, that sin will have no power, no authority over you, no place in you when you got yourself under the authority It of may Jesus. still be going on, but I've disconnected myself from it. It can still be like fomenting and creating trouble in the bubble now. over there, mm-hmm. but I'm not being, I'm not getting blowback from You're it. You're not getting right. sucked into it. Yeah. Because the enemy, sin has no place in you, the enemy has no place in you either. I think that piece about being under authority of Jesus Christ, um, it's important. And I'm just, I want to be back here. But, you know, a lot of people read that and go, like, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. But it's the salvation, it's being positionally under Him, but it's also that sanctification, right? Because if you're, mm-hmm. say, you're saved, but you're w- willingly not becoming sanctified, not being holy, you're not going to have that power. That's right. That's right. That's, right. That's the whole point of Ephesians sit, walk, stand. If you're not in right relationship with God and right relationship with man, you're not going to have authority over the enemy in some situations. That's why we have Christians that, I mean, it's a blanket statement, but you know, Christians that are just sit on the right hand oh. side over there. Yeah. yeah. It's true. It's true. So holiness is being under authority. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you're under authority, you have power. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, the theology of sloppy grace. Um, sloppy grace. I. Oh, God's going to take care of me. You know. Um, as a blanket statement, without doing the hard work of getting under authority. And it's in Hebrews, the writer describes it as make every effort to enter his rest. This is where rest is. Mm-hmm. Once yes. you're here in rest, you know how powerful you are. You can't rest until you know how powerful you are. But you can't have power until you're at rest. Mm. Say it again. <laughs> you can't rest until you know how powerful you are, but you can't have power until you're at rest. Because rest is power. Rest is power. Rest, let's equate the two. There's the jump. Rest. 
rest is power. Explain that more. Go for it. Okay. Just like whenever I know that uh, uh, in the forgiveness issue, the power to go against my feeling of not wanting to do it is in that rest. Because out of that rest, he's given me the power to override my feelings to go and do what I know is right, which is to forgive, even when I don't feel like it. But that power to do that is not my own power, because my flesh doesn't want to do it. So there has to be a power that comes from somewhere inside of me that goes against the grain, against my feelings to do it, because deep down inside of me, even though I don't feel like doing it, I want to do it. And the want to do it comes out of that rest. That's right. And the fullness of that rest is when I forgive. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I agree. God showed me that in the past few years, that to get to rest is through healing. Healing our heart is what gets us, Him healing our heart is what gets us to rest. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so, much, so many places we could go there. Yeah, we could right. just shoot healthy. Because mm -hmm. your immune system will be strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we're three part um, mm. There's the gates of Nehemiah. The first gate is the, uh, the sheep gate, and the last gate is the inspection gate. Mm -hmm. Those ten gates. And, and it's the Christian walk from starting with the sheep gate to the fish gate to the dung gate and just all around until you get to the inspection gate. That inspection gate is like the, the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. The inspection gate, you allow in what comes in and you stay out what you don't want in. You inspect something. Your heart, your life is under the control of Holy Spirit, the submission to Holy Spirit. And if he says, no, don't go with that thought, okay, I don't go with that thought. Mm -hmm. And you have the authority and the power to <coughs> say no to that thought. Mm -hmm. But like you say, he says, do something really difficult. Yes, Holy Spirit, I can do that by your power. Come mm -hmm. on in, I open my gate to that. Right. You can do that because you're under the authority, the power of Holy Spirit. And you have in your life the authority to follow Holy Spirit. <clears throat> that's the inspection gate. That's the tenth gate of Nehemiah. And that's where we're all headed. Every one of us in this room has the authority, the power, the rest, to follow Holy Spirit in everything He tells us to do. Like to stand up at Fort Mountain and declare deliverance over this entire community and principalities and powers flee. We all have that authority when we step into that relationship with Holy Spirit to the extent that we are going there. We're getting there. But it starts with the sheep gate, which is a heart to follow Him, a heart to obey, even when it's tough. And I remember when I was a newborn Christian and I had my heart was just full of all kinds of sin. <coughs> And he said to me, the sheep gate is in place because your heart is to follow me. I remember him saying that one day. The sheep gate is in place because your heart is to follow me. I felt so proud. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so good. I have the sheep gate in place. It was years later until it dawned on me there were nine more gates. <laughs> So he's such an encourager, you know. <laughs> he was saying, "Yes, yes, yes, you got the sheep gate in place." <laughs> and I went on to the fish gate, you know, like, <laughs> just to believe the word of God, even when you don't see any evidence of it. That's the fish gate, the the, the, the water. The fish lives in water, which is the word of God, and eats, breathes, lives, does everything in water in the word of God. When you live your life totally an agreement with the Word of God because you know if, it's, if God said it, it's so and that settles it. I believe it because it's in this Word. Well, it might not be true in my life yet, but it will be true because I believe it. There's this commitment to the Word of God. Well, anyway, but, but anyway, it was, it was like that first gate, the sheep gate, you met your heart may be to follow Him. 
but you're not able to follow him because all of this all this other junk is at work in your life. So as you go through the process step by step, he empowers you as you keep coming under his authority, under his authority, under his authority. It may be a struggle for, for the first season of your walk with him to stay under authority and to follow him. But each piece is put in place and eventually you're walking in that inspection gate where your everything is under the authority, the control of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we're all headed. Anybody else have anything to add? I think I'm done. So how are we going to activate this? To act in the opposite spirit. Mm -hmm. Take it. Say more. Well, that's what I've been saying. Whenever I know to forgive, but I don't feel like forgiving, then I act opposite of how I'm feeling. Yeah. If I, uh, <laughs> forgive me. That, that, right there, that right there is authority over the flesh you're talking about. Right. It's, it bonds. The flesh it doesn't want well, to do it. And, so and, to me, acting in the opposite spirit means when my flesh doesn't want to do it, but I do it, then that's acting the opposite of what I want to do. To do the, it's First John four nineteen. You know, he says in First John four nineteen, it says we love him because he first loved us, and the word he in that verse means master of the rest, and that just simply means. That he's the master of the rest of what it takes for me to love the unlovable person. And when I submit to the master, he gives me the power to go get what I feel to love that unlovable person. And the reason I can do that is because he first loved me. Yes. Yes. Because. So it's act, to me, it's acting in, in the opposite. Yes. Yes. Because you're under the authority of Jesus Christ. The master. The master of life who is giving you life. Because he laid down his life so that you can have life. And there's the power of the resurrection that you're walking in. We don't do it in our own strength. Even, even like this girl in Columbia I prayed with. 13, 14 years old, been a prostitute since she was nine, was born on the streets, grew up on the streets. Her mother was murdered at age nine on the street. And that's the day she became a prostitute so she could live. She was 13, 14. She met Jesus that day. And I asked her, what is your greatest struggle? And she said, to forgive the man who murdered my mom. Because that was the only person she had ever known who loved her. She said she tried. She couldn't do it. And I just said, well, ask Jesus to help you forgive. And as soon as she, as she asked him, she turned to him and she asked him, this big old restful smile came over her face. It's like, Jesus is more than enough in any situation. Back to Anna Mendez in that deliverance. She knew she was full of light, but she didn't go in and try to set that captive free. She walked in with Jesus and invited him to set the captive free. It's all about the power of Jesus. Once we start crossing over into trying to do it in our own strength, we've gotten out from under authority. Mm -hmm. And there's where we will no longer have his power, but we'll be doing it in our own strength. And I can guarantee you there's no rest in that. Exactly. Amen. I'm going to say something like that, too. Um, whenever I get together with this group, first of all, three times a time, it's always the holy, holy, holy thing comes to me all the time. And in the power of a group, I just see us all turning around the throne, like flying around there, and it be it becomes like centrifugal force. There's really a lot of force and power mm -hmm. in that turning and going around and new things coming. And when you were talking about the light, um, to me, rest is peace. Mm -hmm. And like Johnny says, let peace be your umpire. The only time I have a I have a specific situation where the person or the situation does not want truth or love put into it. Very resistant. None of that. No. So forget I've been, you know, I've, I've done all the forgiveness and stuff. 
that's not asked for, that's not welcome, so I'm having to do it on my own. The only safe place that I feel that I can do this is in the peace of knowing this has nothing to do with me. I can rest and be peaceful if I just blast the light of God into this situation. It's not circumstantial, but it's, it's me turning toward God and asking to be filled with more light. Like this is, I am the conduit. It's nothing to do with me. It has to be that way. Fill me with more light. I get this big gold thing right here, and then you just blast it in the situation because only that, that's undeniable to anyone. When anybody's in the presence of that, they don't know what to do with it. And that's what we can build together. I think in a group, we can build more light here. That It's the way it happens. It gets filled right. faster and... and You're right, and you just confirm and what I here. What we should do next. Um, I was asking the Lord, how do we activate this? And I was hearing him say, see the light in other people in the room. Yeah. And that's exactly what you started talking. Johnny, will you help me? Let's let's walk around and let's anoint everyone. And and as we do that, um, we're just going to go lay hands on you. And we want you to keep your eyes open, look across the room, and ask Holy Spirit to show you the light in another. <laughs> 